Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, USDA raises the size of the grain piles. The market moves lower on the report. Big questions about highs, inputs, and futures remain. Market analysis from Naomi Bloom, Elaine Cub, Ted Seifert, and Matthew Bennett, next. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the October 15 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. The shock received by this week's USDA report produced a downward move for the major commodities. The markets try to shake it off as commodities bounce back at week's end. Now, we've brought in our panel of experts to break down what's been happening and what might be the next trend. Before we get to our discussion, let's set the table. Retail sales rose seven-tenths of a percent as consumers spent a little more on clothing, back-to-school purchases, and hobbies. The increases were being made in the face of higher prices as the consumer price index bumped up four-tenths of a percent. Without food and energy, core CPI only moved two-tenths of a percent higher. Now, those making the products we buy have seen prices rise as the producer price index moved half a percent higher. But what compared to year over year, the index rose 8.6 percent, the largest jump in nearly a decade. Now, we do have a panel discussion to get to, but first, let's start with the numbers. For the week, the nearby wheat contract was even, while the December corn contract shed a nickel. The November soybean contract posted a 25 cent loss. December meal dropped to 10 per ton. December cotton fell $3.08 per hundredweight. In the dairy parlor, November class three milk futures moved higher by 58 cents. A mixed week in the livestock sector, December cattle added 73 cents, November feeders improved 28 cents, and the December lean hog contract weakened 322. In the currency markets, U.S. dollar index dropped 10 ticks, November crude oil added 273 per barrel, Comex gold gained 980 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs commodity index improved more than 12 points to finish at 593.15. Now here to provide insight are our market analysts, Ted Seifert, Chief Market Strategist at Zaner Ag Hedge, Naomi Bloom, she's Senior Market Advisor for Total Farm Marketing, Elaine Cub, author of Mastering the Grain Markets, and Matthew Bennett, he's co-founder of agmarket.net. To the four of you, welcome to the table. How about this little report? We've had a couple of little reports, Naomi. You can't say the real words you think about some of these reports lately. But what are you thinking about these reports lately when they come out? It's interesting to see how the numbers twist and turn just enough to ultimately, I think, leave a point of equilibrium. And here's, here's why I say that. You know, we still have a market now where the soybeans used to be the friendliest whole thing in the whole complex, and now they are the, the follower. With ending stocks being bearish and getting bigger than trade was anticipating, corn's still second place in this. The report was neutral to slightly bearish for corn. But ending stocks still just at a point where it makes you have to think and wonder what's going to happen next year. And then, of course, the wheat report was friendly. So you got the wheat market trading at the higher end of the range. So we have a lot to talk about on the panel today. I'm really excited to discuss where we think things are going to be going in the short term for the long term, because there's so many different points on the report that we really need to dissect. So, Ted, do you see the report differently? I don't think the report was terribly bearish, really. I mean, you know, we knew we were going to have bigger ending stocks, especially for soybeans, when we saw the bigger beginning stocks. Now, it's a bigger number than what we had been thinking three or four weeks ago, but it's still a relatively tight number. We still have to get through the South American growing season, and if they have any problems there and we see a little bit more demand, we can still have a, a scenario where we run out of soybeans. So that bullish story is still potentially there. 
I think we've come down to the target. I mean, I've been saying, well documented on the show, I was talking about 1180 for a harvest low for November beans. We got to 1184. Um, I think we're good. I, I, I think now we have the opportunity to see a little bit of a post-harvest rally into the end of the calendar year until we see, until we know what is going on with South America and what their crop looks like. And uh, uh, corn, 1.5 billion bushel carryover is still relatively tight. If we see any extra demand, that's going to get really tight too. So the stories aren't over. We don't really know. We're sort of in that time frame where it can go either way. But we've already come down, I think, enough. Now I think we're ready to bounce. Matt, you've seen the harvest yield monitors on the combine. Do they jive with what you saw from USDA? Yeah, I mean, in all honesty, coming into this report, I thought the easiest thing to predict was that soybean crop was going to get bigger. I mean, I tell you, every producer I talk to says, you know, my beans were better than expected or my beans met my expectations and I had really big expectations. So I thought that the bean crop going up to 51.5 was, uh, it's actually the number we picked. Now, we got kind of lucky there, but I would tell you that we felt like it was going to go up a decent amount. What do I think is going to happen from here? I think the bean crop grows from here, quite frankly. I, I think it's a big bean crop. Uh, but as far as corn was concerned, I just didn't think it would move much because for corn, it's been a mixed bag. I mean, about every producer you talk to has a different story than the last producer you talk to. Some of them are talking about record yields, best ever. Others are saying, you know what, we're 70 under what we were expecting because we were dealing with disease issues, nitrogen loss, you name it. There's a whole host of things that this corn crop dealt with in certain parts of the Midwest that I'll tell you what, it's kind of evened out those areas where you you just had phenomenal corn. So mixed bag on corn, really good crop on beans. I wasn't too surprised. Elaine, you get to either analyze what they've said or come up with something different because you came from a different direction where things look differently in South Dakota. Yeah, I was going to say you talk about areas where they're not quite as great. Well, yeah, in South Dakota, in, in the Dakotas and lots of the Western Corn Belt, there was an extreme drought. And in fact, there is still a drought even in Iowa. There's still D2 drought in areas. So, I mean, all that really doesn't matter very much in October, and we're getting rain now that will get folks set up for 2022. But, um, yeah, I don't think that necessarily it was, it was perfect. And that kind of goes to Ted's point that you have to look forward into 2022 now. If you look at the global numbers from this week's report, for global feed, looking in next year, is talking a 5% improvement in, in, in stocks and inventories for corn and for soybean meal and for any sort of a feed grain. So that's better, but it's not so much better that end users are going to sit back and, and sigh and feel like they've been relieved. They still have to be paying up for convenience yield. And you're seeing that in basis markets, right? In the basis prices, end users still want to get their hands on the possession of these commodities because they know they're going to need it. All right, yeah. Naomi. Uh you, you, I want to go back to what, something you said about wheat. I mean, we're trading over $7. We've been on a run that maybe bucks some of the trend and conventional thought coming into this season. Do you see this continuing? I think that the wheat market is going to continue to, to hold some strength here in the short term. The spring wheat market still is trying to figure out how many acres it can attract for next year. I think we're going to see that market get up to the $10 future mark. So it's getting closer, I think will happen next week. And then $10 is such a significant resistance point. Now the expectation is that with fertilizer costs being so expensive that potentially we see more acres shift into wheat here um, across the Midwest, but we need it. We need more acres of spring wheat. We need more acres of Kansas wheat. We need the, the Chicago wheat market. And I think that you're gonna see it pick up. So the wheat market, it's supported because the ending stocks are so tight, but at the same time, Speaking to 2022, it knows that more supply is potentially coming. I'm going to go back to South Dakota and wheat country because what are you hearing from people? Are they going to plant more next year in light of some of the things? <laughs> well, yeah, if you've got $10 wheat, I mean, that's, that's the motivation. And I, I would just caution folks not to get too worked up about I shouldn't even say it on TV, right? But like the 2008 price of $24, right? Like when yeah. you talk about how high could it go, uh, you never really know, especially in the environment we are for commodities generally. It's just so inflationary. So it, it could get wild. And I think, yes, that would be very motivational to acres. All right. So, Ted, the acre battle, do you see wheat losing to corn next year? Does wheat lose acres? Does wheat gain acres? Wheat losing to corn? No, I think everybody's talking about corn losing acres because of right. input costs, right? And I don't know. Um, you know, we have markets, and natural gas in particular, which is one that drives uh, a lot of input costs for, for corn and beans. But that market has a tendency to spike and then come back down. And maybe it does. Maybe we have a better chance to book input costs later. If you haven't already, we'll have to see. I was talking to a guy this morning in South Dakota, and he's like, you know what? 
I was thinking about planting more wheat, but I'm not going to. I'd rather just trade the wheat with you and we'll, we'll farm it on paper, all right? Um, I have a feeling there's a fair amount of people that are like that. I mean, there's just been that move away from wheat in, year, in the last few years, and I don't know how easy it is to come back to that. So, I don't know. I think wheat acres will increase, but I don't know if it's going to be this massive jump that we're going to see, and I don't think the corn acres are going to fall that massively either. Yeah, right. and I think that's a good point where we're going to be in a holding pattern here for, I think, an, uh, a month or two with prices because of really not un understanding for sure what the producers are going to be motivated to plant in the spring. And you talk to the producers in, in North Dakota, and for the first time in years, I'm hearing them say, oh, I'm thinking about sunflowers, I'm thinking about barley, I'm thinking about oats, I'm thinking about canola. And that is a new conversation that we haven't had in a while. So there is still a lot of shifting, and there's some acres that need to continue to fight for prices. And you look at cotton, and that market got through some resistance levels on charts, and cotton ending stocks are half what they were a year ago. That was friendly on the report for U.S. cotton. So there's a lot of fight for acres to come yet. The conversation is going to be ongoing. Um, what I like about corn carryout at 1.5 billion bushels, last year it was at 1.5 billion bushels for three months, January, February, March, and the price of corn was just stuck between $5 and $5.50. So I'm just kind of thinking we're going to see quiet prices for now, and then I think we'll see some fireworks towards the end of the year. All right, so Matt, you get unfortunately pegged with a question from a viewer here to start about corn, but it's the same thing I was going to ask you. Mike in Dyersville, Iowa, asking about corn. He's asking, would you be selling off the combine if our cash price is still over $5 and we don't have storage? You know, the thing is for me, uh, I'm not a huge fan uh, of commercial storage all the time. I, I, for, I think there's a lot of different ways to look at it. But for instance, let's say it costs you 25 cents to get out to Gen 1. I think there's some things that you can do. Get your uh, hands on the money, you know, and spend less than 25 cents and still have a pretty good uh, opportunity to make some money on further down the road. I think whenever you look at corn, uh, you know, you've got you to gotta ask yourself, is, is it just cash corn that's going to be driving price later on or is it the whole corn situation? And I, I think uh, just to go back to the acres discussion, I think there's a whole lot of things going on for the corn market that could be supportive on farther down the road. Uh, you, you know, it's not just input costs that's going to be driving a pullback from corn acreage. It's can I get a hold of anhydrous this next spring if we don't have a good run this next fa this fall? Uh, you know, a lot of the Midwest is getting kind of wet right now, so it's very concerning. And uh, these input costs are definitely a, a deterrent, but it's getting a hold of what you need to get a hold of to be able to plant the crop, I think, is as big a deal as anything. Okay, Matt, you bring up a point. Uh, drought monitor came out yesterday and we have the latest drought monitor and if you're sitting in an area that's been dry and then all of a sudden you see rain in the immediate future um, or in the immediate past do you change your mind about what you're looking ahead if you're still in drought the map says I'm still in drought but it's so wet I can't do any fall field work. Am I changing my mind about well, I think there's a general consensus amongst a lot of producers and they're saying, you know what, I'm going to wait on these input prices. I'm going to wait till next spring. If they, if we don't get relief by next spring, I'm going to go ahead and plant soybeans. But I guess my thought as a producer is you might be able to pay $1,400 a ton for anhydrous and make money because if everyone else is going to switch to beans, what am I going to do? I want to plant corn because I think corn acreage could be uh, a little bit scary. And, and so, uh, I mean, it could be fairly low uh, if all the right things fall into place. So absolutely, weather has to play into it. Uh, you got to pay attention. Uh, the bottom line is there could be some very dynamic stuff happen in the next few months. Elaine, you've heard that argument before. If everybody's going to go on one side of the boat, go to the other. Right. Do you do, is that what's going to, are we going to outthink ourselves on corn? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think historically, or if you look as, as a nationwide picture, there's there's usually not that much shifting, honestly, you know, because mostly it's 50-50 one way or another. And some people will strategize particularly based on what their local weather is. But as far as the markets are concerned, we should still expect roughly a 50-50 sort of rotation. All right, Ted, what do you think? I mean, you look at the strength in December 22 corn, obviously there is something that is keeping that, that stronger relative to December 21. There is a concern in the market that we might see a shift out of corn acres. But I think I agree with these guys. I don't think there's going, or these two, <laughs> I don't think there is going to be a dramatic shift out of corn acres. We like to plant corn. We have good prices for Dece 22. The, most of the guys, uh, I'm, the guys that work with me, we've been talking about 20 to 25 percent sold on new crop corn at this point. And, and a lot of us, we've booked a lot of our inputs already, you know, before they got really crazy. So. The corn acres is going to be there. Can it swing 2 million, 3 million acres? Maybe, maybe. But we're not going to lose 10 million acres of corn because of input costs. It's just not going to happen. And ethanol is 
so fantastic right now too. So there's motivation there, there's incentive there. Those are the, the ethanol plants have been lately bidding up cash markets right now here at harvest time to keep having that supply come in. I think they're very well aware that prices for corn could continue higher, especially when you have crude oil for an entire week staying above $80 a barrel. That's very significant. Um, so I'm really pleased to see that the ethanol is doing well. I think the margins are good. I mean, the margins are good right mm -hmm. now. There's no question about it. And I, I don't expect a 10 million acre ship. You've got to expect the 87 million acres of, of soybeans are going to go to corn. I mean, that, that's got to be the, the assumption, I guess, from my vantage point. Now, how high do you get over there? How many people are going to want to go out and spend the money on corn on corn? I think in the I states, you still retain some of that corn on corn. But I don't think that, uh, I think that getting significantly over 90 might be a little bit tough, especially with all the different, everyone, everyone's buying for acres this year. Whether wheat and cotton, you name it, Milo, the sorghum, sunflowers I mean, and canola. Yes, and everything, absolutely. Yeah. Everyone's trying to get the acreage, and so I, there's the, there's going to be a big fight, a big battle, in my opinion. I think that if you if you see these input costs the way that they are, if they stay the way they are, then I think that you're going to have to see this corn at least stay supported. I'm not saying it's going to rally through the roof, but I think it's at least going to have to stay supported. Yeah, I agree that there, there's support here, I and mean, just, just when, you, like I mentioned before, the end users are demonstrating that. You mentioned the, the ethanol plants. Cedar Rapids is five over, so countryside bids are 20, 30 under, which is not historic, but it's pretty darn good for for harvest time frame. And you go out to the Western Corn Belt, any sort of livestock producing areas, the Dakotas, Kansas, down into the Panhandle of Oklahoma and Texas, basis is extremely hot. So, mm -hmm. so it's not just ethanol; it's it's the livestock producers too. The end users do want to get their hands on this corn, even at the harvest guts, a lot of harvest. Yeah. One last thing on acreage that we can't, uh, in my opinion, that we can't deny is that uh, whatever's fresh in your mind a lot of times as a producer is something you're going to look at. And we're harvesting one heck of a soybean crop this year. And so I think yeah. that there's a lot of producers, you know, <clears throat> hey, you know what, 75, 80 bushel beans and we just uh, experienced a buck, buck 50 drop in the price of beans and I'm still grossing close to a thousand bucks an acre. Uh, it's something that you can't, uh, you can't just deny. I mean, mm -hmm. and so I do think that the, the strength of how good soybeans have been this year, not only from a profit margin standpoint, but bushels per acre, is definitely going to factor into the discussion. Yeah, so, and you're right. I mean, I, I think we're feeling a lot more comfortable about soybean yields and, and the fact that they're just going to be there, right? I mean, the, the variability isn't as bad as it was a few years ago, similar to how we felt about corn, or still feel about corn, but that change happened in corn a few years ago. Uh, to go back to Naomi's point, yes, domestically, corn demand strong because of ethanol and strong because of feed. The one missing piece of that puzzle is exports, right? And when do we start to see the corn exports really get going? We were, we were. We saw, we saw a big purchase from Mexico this week. I mean, it's, it's still yeah. happening. We need bigger. We ones. don't get excited about a, Me a Mexican corn purchase. Well, we should. We, we don't. There, we should, yes. there were one or two on our, 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 uh, their, our first or second biggest customer, depending on right. where Japan is every year. But we need these these export sales weeks where we're at 2.4 2.6 million metric tons rather than you know 1.1 1. Yeah. 1.2 so when does that happen i think that shift will start happening in a big way between now and the end of the calendar year because i think a lot of these global end users were waiting for that low to come in and yeah. now what happened at the end of this week kind of says oh maybe that low is in now we need to get more aggressive so i think things good things on the export front yeah. to come in the next i agree few weeks. with that I agree with that. In I think soybeans. you're going to see soybeans and corn. I think oh. you're going to see the export pace pick up because exactly that reason that it's, oh, this is it. This is the low. You can't compare though this year to last year just because, of course, prices were so significantly cheaper last year. So I don't know that we're going to be to the pace that we were last year, but I think we're going to pick up the pace. So that's so, encouraging. So. Ted, open the door for a very specific question, but maybe I might go with you instead on this one, Naomi. Uh, Gary in Franksville, Wisconsin is asking, what are some key dates and quantities we need to see China purchases in beans before we panic? I don't know if it's a... Well, I would say the date needs to be between now and Thanksgiving, and we need to see it sooner than later, because then that, that'll really make the market a little bit more satisfied. I think just a consistent number weekly would be great if they do one big panic number, I, the market may, I don't want to say panic, but then have too much of a oom fire. China likes to come in and just do small incremental purchases and then every once in a while something a little bit bigger, but they wait for the pullbacks too and they're watching and then when the pullbacks come, that's when they come in with their buying. I'll tell you what, whenever they think that the lows are in, there's no question, but I would say that we're not, all, we're not necessarily going to know 
uh, whenever the sales are made to China. I mean, last year, that was a perfect uh, evidence of that, especially with, with regards to corn. January and March, both times, every time that we announced these sales, what did we do by the end of the day? We sold off. And so I do think that there'll be some, uh, there'll be some Chinese interest. And I think that what's going to happen is, is you'll see a little bit of strength in the market. Nobody's going to know exactly what's going on. You've got to make the assumption that they've stepped in and bought some soybeans. Elaine, do you anticipate um, that short of a time frame on that soybean story? Oh, that, yep. I would just I would repeat ex everything yeah. they just said. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, Ted, anything else on beans? Yeah, I want to see cover? four million metric tons of soybeans sold in the next three weeks. That's to anywhere. Just sold, period. Specifically to China, but yeah, I mean, if Mexico wants to come in and take some big chunks too, look, it's great to get the global end users sort of competing with each other, right? If Mexico starts getting more aggressive, China will say, oh, well, we need to come and do that too, and vice versa. So yeah, I want to see 4 million metric tons of soybeans sold in the next three weeks, and I want to see a lot of it happening on a daily wire. You've talked about how we sell off during the day after seeing a purchase. Well, I think a lot of that is, you know, we see these 132,000 metric ton purchases and we say, oh, that's disappointing. You know, okay, great, there's a daily sale, and then you open it up, uh, and it's just not what you would ha hope to see, and it's not what we had been seeing last year. So I, I think that's kind of why we do that. I, I want to see that pace really accelerate. We saw that Friday morning. Okay. We need to keep up with that. If we do that, then I think there's dollar to dollar fifty upside potential in soybeans. Cotton, real quick, because do you see cotton fitting into any of this discussion we've had? It was mentioned earlier. Do you see it? No, cotton had its own little thing going on this week. You know, it's very rare that you have a pattern in a commodity market that you can really predict. And cotton actually did it this week, where you have a really streaky high bubble. But then because of the China, the, the global story that China has been pulling back their, their cotton production um, of fiber and such, that's what really, I think, spooked that market. And now we're pulling back, and I think it could continue to pull back. Okay, live cattle, Naomi, um, we are still putting on some gains, but we're, we're changing. Is that story changing about the consumer as we all of a sudden see numbers start to tick up of or down on infections of COVID? Maybe we'll start eating again? Is that going to be the story of the um, So what's market? interesting is that trade right now is assuming that with gasoline prices going higher and with um, maybe people feeling more pinched at the grocery store that the consumer is going to eat less beef. Now let me tell you, for an entire year I was wrong. In 2013 and 14, that was the last time we had the $100 crude oil. We had cattle prices up 140 150 And I said on this show twice, people can't afford it. They're going to eat tuna noodle casserole. And I was wrong for an entire year. Because the beef demand is there, there is no substitute for beef. Cuts at the store got a little bit smaller. Maybe instead of a pound and a half of hamburger in your spaghetti, you scale it back to a pound. The demand is there. There is no substitute for beef. And I think the market is going to be surprised to see that because they're assuming it's not going to be there. Um, but I, I'm still friendly for cattle. I think it's going to be slow going here for the short term. Cash markets are pretty quiet. But the deferred contracts, we got less cattle coming down the pipeline. Demand's strong. And I'll tell you what, a lot of people thought that demand was going to completely fall apart whenever people quit going to restaurants. But what I said all along is that instead of going out and spend $100 for a couple of steaks for you and your wife or, or whoever you are uh, going out with, you'd spend uh, $100 on seven steaks and yeah. uh, cook them over the course of two weekends. So uh, beef demand is strong, and I do expect that we're going to see a rally uh, into, into the spring time frame. I, I'd, I'd get into the 140s, maybe even a little bit above that. The big story was always the cut choice was different. The, the demand was there. So in the feeder story, let's go back to the dryness of, mm. of certain regions. Is that going to impact us? Got a great question out of North Dakota saying, is this, this is going to be a dramatic impact on feed because these animals are yeah. coming off dry pastures and they have more to feed. Yeah, and in fact, there is a, there, we're not seeing the big fall runs yet necessarily at the sale barns, but in North Dakota, you are already seeing people bringing in their calves right off the cow, which is not ideal, but it is going to impact the feed usage then for those calves through, through the course of their lives. But in the areas where we are seeing the, uh, the spring calves coming to market already, the demand, as Matt said, is good or characterized as very good. I mean, people want to put these calves into feedlots and get the, going through the entire supply chain, absolutely. All right, Ted, bullish hogs still? Yeah, I mean, sort of for the same reason. Uh, domestic demand is not going anywhere. You know, we talk about, you know, higher energies and higher food prices or whatever, but look at the stock market. It's going crazy as well. It just continues to chug along. People feel like they have money. People have money. People are spending money. I don't see domestic demand going anywhere. And, you know, we keep stringing together really good weeks of export sales for, for hogs or for uh, pork, and we don't have as many animals out there as we thought we did. Now, we had a bit of a corrective week this week. 
we held right where we needed to on Friday. I'd like to see some follow through to the upside early next week. I need to see that. But overall, yeah, I think the December hog contract should be trading pretty close to where October was. Let's call it 92 to 96, somewhere in that neighborhood. And that's a ways away to go from where we're at right yeah, now. Yeah, it, it needs to get pulled up to even match the, the, the CME index. I mean, mm -hmm. absolutely, that, that convergence will happen, almost right. certainly. Naomi's 30 seconds of dairy. What's going on? Because we've keep, we keep rallying. Yeah, we have um, milk prices, 1950. So that was the price this week. We got as high as the May price for um, nearby contracts. So absolutely amazing. It's a combination of more uh, cattle coming to slaughter. We have milk production that is finally trending lower. We've got phenomenal exports, up 13% from a year ago. Butter is up 100% from a year ago for exports. And the cheese demand is strong right now, seasonally, it's that time of year. So it's a friendly story, but now we're at the point where everything is high enough that it probably needs to have a little bit of a pullback. But the trend is finally, finally changing. So we got some good news for dairy. 33 seconds, very good. Oh, got it good. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. That's uh, <laughs> Naomi and Matt and Elaine and Ted. Thank you all, appreciate your time as always. And that will do it for this installment of Market to Market. The conversation continues in Market Plus. We're just getting started, so join us there. Find that on our website, markettomarket.org. And we have to tell you, we hit a milestone this week on our YouTube page. You rang our bell and put us over 5,000 subscribers. Thank you so very much. Click subscribe at Market to Market. And you, too, can be in our inner circle of knowing when the stories, Market Plus, and full program, and anything else that we have are ready for viewing. Next week, we explore how a dry weather bet paid off for some grain farmers. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.